I met Pastor Chapel in Northern California when he first came out of college. He was serving in a church where I was preaching, and uh, he immediately struck me as someone who had a lot of energy. He had great vision for the tasks that he was involved with in that church. He, uh, of course, was on staff at a good church, had a good position, was very successful in the ministry he was involved in. And it was about uh, a month or so ago that a, a fella down in Lancaster, the pastor there, began calling us and calling me and saying, I'd like for you to come and preach. He was a visiting pastor. He was on vacation. Our pastor at that time called, asked him if he'd stop by and visit with us. And he had already set it up. He said, this man is coming to, to audition for your, to be your pastor. So they asked him if he would preach. And of course, being a young preacher, he, he wanted to preach anywhere he could. At that point, we did not know that pastor didn't know that he was auditioning to be our pastor. And he took us um, around to the back of this little building and up a flight of stairs to an upstairs tiny room. So my sister-in-law, Sandy, and I sat down and we heard Pastor Chapel preach uh, as a visitor um, as he was just passing through town. Then after he had preached on Sunday night, they uh, asked him to be dismissed for a few minutes. After church, I told Terry, I said, good night, I can't wait to get out of here tonight. This, this thing is not appealing at all. There's no pastors knocking the doors down to get into that church. And then that night, we took the vote to call him as our pastor. Of course, they were only 13 eligible voters at that time, and so we voted him in unanimously. When he came back in, they said that we have just voted for you to become our pastor. And of course, I guess he expressed himself. He, he did not know he was candidating. <laughs> and as we drove around uh, that day, uh, God began to convict my heart that what I needed to look for was not a position, not a church that could uh, give things to me or take care of me or a larger established church, but what I needed to be looking for was an opportunity where God wanted me to be. I was surprised he accepted and I was surprised he came because his wife was expecting their third child. We didn't have, uh, couldn't offer him any pay. We couldn't offer him any, no salary, no housing, uh, nothing. I mean, none of the benefits that he should have gotten as a pastor, we, we didn't, couldn't offer it to him. But he came anyway. We came to Lancaster Baptist Church to build a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, independent Baptist church. We came here uh, to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing was getting the gospel out from house to house and place to place. And in every service, lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. He was full of excitement. Um, and he had just so many ideas of what he wanted to do that we were unaccustomed to. You know, but you could, you, you kind of fed off of his energy and you said, wow, this man knows what he wants to do and where he wants to go. So, you know, let's jump on board and, and, and see where it takes us. We was going to let him have a little bit of time to settle into his apartment, you know, and then we would go down and begin to work with him and support him in the ministry and whatnot. And the first Sunday, he preached the messages on Sunday morning. On Tuesday night, there was soul winning. On Wednesday night, he'd go out and <coughs> preach at other churches to raise support. On Thursday night, we had uh, our midweek service, and we could tell it wasn't gonna be the same thing as usual. We got a knock on our door, and it was uh, Paul Chapel. He introduced himself again and said he was the new pastor that had taken the Lancaster Baptist Church and he came and visited us. Well, he was very excited when he was really trying to start a work here, you could tell. So we thought we'd give it a try. He came to me during that meeting and he said, Brother Gatch, I've taken a church down in Southern California and I uh, believe he probably mentioned Lancaster. I had no idea where that was at the time. So uh, we came in the fall of 1986. The church was uh, off to a great start, uh, running, I think at that time, if I remember, about 40 people. We visited around, and then, uh, so I decided that weekend I'd visit Lancaster Baptist. Finally on a Tuesday night, you know, many months later, uh, Pastor and Dan Sterner came by the house on a Tuesday night and uh, 
for the first time it really clicked with me that I had had a head knowledge of Christ through growing up, uh, but I never accepted him personally. And so it was on a Tuesday night that I accepted Christ as my personal savior and baptized a week or so later. On the Sunday before I got saved, uh, shaking pastor's hand on the way out that Sunday morning, he asked if he can come by that following Tuesday. And I said, sure. And uh, uh, that Tuesday night, him and uh, Paul Tierney came to the house, had a few questions, and my trust in Jesus Christ got saved that night. I want to be a part of a church doing something for God. And I want them 15 and 20 years from now to say, here come the Baptists again. They're knocking on our door again. They're trying to get us saved. And I want them to know there was a church that cared about them. Uh, first of the year that we'd seen substantial growth and enough to, to have enough workers and stuff to support the bus ministry. So. In January of 87, we started the first bus route, and we had uh, three riders the first Sunday. I uh, got saved when I was a teenager and started going to the Christian high school, and I wanted that from our kids, but when we came, there wasn't one. We started Lancaster Baptist School uh, September of 1989 with 47 students. Mrs. Houck taught kindergarten, had 10 kindergarten students, and then we had first grade through 12th grade in one room. Yeah, with the video. And so when they started that, that first year, we were so excited when, when the Hawks came and started the school because we knew we'd have somewhere to uh, educate our kids. The thing about Lancaster is every year when I would come back, it seemed like it had gained more momentum. That the revival that we saw during a week of meetings, it just seemed like it picked right back up again, that it had never stopped. And, and it was actually at a, a higher point than it was the year before. And I began to realize that God was doing something very unique here. It wasn't something where it was just for a moment or for a year or temporarily, but that God had had a special plan for Lancaster Baptist Church. And it was obvious from that continual state of revival that the church was in, that this was something special. 20 months ago, my family and I came to the Antelope Valley it was with great joy and anticipation in our hearts that we look forward to the opportunity of serving the Lord here. During these past 20 months, we have seen over 250 people trust Christ as Savior. Over 140 have followed the Lord in believer's baptism. It has been a great joy to see God send to our church a great host of workers who have become burdened for the Antelope Valley. Even though the church was small at the time, but it was growing and you'd see it week after week and month after month. So you saw you saw the church growing. This pastor announced it when we reached that 50 and then we reached the 100, we reached 200 and so on and so on. We had 348 in church day, isn't that great? Amen. You knew we needed room. Uh, how much room you really didn't know, but we knew we needed to move. He said, uh, as a church family, you know, he said, it's not going to be long before we're going to need a bigger place than this. We had an, our first uh, banquet, and we was going to do this anyway to raise money for some property that we didn't know where it would be, and we just wanted to raise money. Thank God tonight, the cash offering received was $29,500, commitments $25,000, for a total of 54500 and that's a great picture, amen? So as we got closer to talking about the acreage that was out here and whatever, they said, well, they want $50,000 down. And the said, that's no problem, we got $50,000. But we got it. I mean, our little congregation got it and, and followed Pastor's faith and his vision. I just want to say tonight, thank you for being a church family that has followed your pastor as I have endeavored to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God that this is a church that has demonstrated a working faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. And God help us that there will always be revival meetings and always be missions conferences, always be buses picking up children, that this will always be a place with a working kind of a faith. I think this church is experiencing revival and has been for several years on a local church level. Are you shining in this community, in Lancaster? 
Are you shining at your work, in your home, in your neighborhood? Are you shining for the glory of God? We must shine. This is the command of our Lord. Let your light so shine before men. I am uh, excited by the growth and excited by the spirit that's in this church. I've been in a church as a kid when we built a building, but other than that, I'd never been in a part of a church that was actually full and growing and, and building, um, and that was exciting. It was an exciting atmosphere. Uh, it was full. Everything that went on was packed. We had people at uh, the high school. We had people everywhere. Literally, there were we, people sitting in that little outside, whatever you want to call it, room there. We would open up the windows on that side of the building so the people could sit out there and <laughs> hear what's going on inside. We got to experience the crowds because it was packed out. We got to experience the heat because there was no air conditioning. It was hot and it was crowded. And the balcony was getting so crowded then, you know, we're up there in the heat of the balcony, <laughs> we're like this. You know? It was, it was. 90 degrees inside there, oftentimes on a summer night. I used to have the video camera up in the balcony, no air conditioning, about 120 degrees up there. Summer was just almost miserable. In the summer, the building was hot and it was packed, and that little upstairs balcony, yeah, oh I mean, it, my. It, it had to be 105, 110. <laughs> By the way, it's not that hot in here right now. <laughs> it was so hot in that place. We began the first building by faith, and we began the first Sunday school classes by faith, and we began the choir by faith. I mean, everything we've done here has been by faith, and God has honored that faith. And may we never put it in neutral and say, well, it'll all work out. May we always go forward in faith. The construction of the North Building was a very challenging project. Um, we'd hired a general contractor. The contractor who uh, <laughs> originally got the job, he went bankrupt. Foreman ran off of the plans, and so Pastor pretty much took over the general contracting of the building. It was a very large building for somebody who had never done that before, and there were a lot of problems. Uh, the weather was just horrible. It rained forever and ever. Of course, we always ran out of money, and but through it all, Pastor stayed very positive. And I remember one night receiving a bill for more than $60,000 from the electoral contractor that wasn't in the budget. One night we gathered with a few hundred men in that north building. There was no roof even on the building, it was just walls. And I said, I said fellas, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, and, and this wasn't in the budget. And I said, it came in, I, and I gotta tell you, we have a great need tonight. And I felt like a failure as a pastor. I didn't know exactly what would happen. And so tonight, we just need to give God the glory. Tonight, already given tonight, $34,458. And by eight days from now, $25,000 more. The grand total, $59,896. Amen. That $61,000 bill was paid to the glory of God because there was one spirit moving on the hearts of hundreds of men. And what a great joy it has been to see what can be done when there is a spirit of unity to the glory of our God. This church has not been blessed because we've just had idleness as the devil's workshop. We've been busy for the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, for seven and a half years, we've, we've seen you bless. We'd be foolish to stop now. Lord, if that church at 4020 East Lancaster Boulevard ever, ever fails, to be a center of the gospel. I pray you'd burn it down. The Lancaster Baptist Church, led by Paul Chapel, is now located at 40th Street East and Lancaster Boulevard. Uh, we've been able to finish the project because of a lot of faith and a lot of love and work. Former Vice President Dan Quell will be at Lancaster Baptist Church on January 9th for that church's formal dedication, so that's neat. The first building here on 40th Street uh, East was, of course, the North Building and uh, they dedicated it on a Sunday in January and uh, literally filled it. I was, I was truly amazed as soon as we walked in how full it was. That, that was the first thing I saw. Vice President Dan Quayle came and it was, it was packed to the max. 
I remember the dedication Sunday just being, it was packed already, there was an excitement. It was already too small. The growth was, it, it was exponential. It was, it just, you, every week there were new people and it, it, it was, it was amazing how quickly we were growing. What I heard on the radio, it made my heart burn inside my chest. I had never heard anything like it, but there was a part of me that had been waiting to hear that my entire life. So by the time that day came after those radio shows, and I walked in the door here, um, I was ready to be saved. I was saved the very first day I walked in the door here. My uh, folks started attending church, and then my son and daughter-in-law at the time weren't married, but they started coming. So my wife didn't know what that was. She came into church and slammed her hand down on his desk, said, what kind of cult are you running out here? Says, uh, my, uh, my son and daughter-in-law have a, a brand new baby, and, and I, he's out here on a Tuesday night, and he's doing this soul hunting. Pastor uh, asked my wife, said, uh, well, let's pray. And she bowed her head. So they prayed, and then he talked to her, and he says, before you make a decision, why don't you and your husband come? And we came, we got saved in the North Auditorium. It was a, uh, it seemed like the longest invitation I ever went through. And finally he said, I think there's a couple who needs to come forward and get saved. I stood up and I reached my hand out for my wife, and uh, we went forward and got saved. You see, it's not about what you do or what I do, it's about what Jesus did. And the way to God is not through your ladder climbing technique. The way to God is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The workers meeting were such a fun and exciting way um, to convey why we had the standards we had and why we had the principles that we had. So uh, staff got together and would write a script and then uh, they would get together and perform this script. You just knew at some point, you know, Brother Schmidt was going to get, yeah. you know, taken down by pastor, and everybody would be, you know, hooting and hollering, waiting for that moment to happen, you know, bring revival to Brother Schmidt, you know. And then pastor would always make a dramatic entrance and save everybody and make them repent and get back on the right track. Well, the, really, the only thing I do remember is poor Brother Schmidt. He would get beat down every single time. <laughs> How could you take our church in a doctrinal position that would compromise everything we've been training for? It taught them the worker standards, you know, how to dress and what Bible to read and not to drink and stuff like that. And it was great back in the day. I'm going to share my heart with you on an issue. This issue that I'm going to discuss with you is something that has really only been a dream in my heart. Pastor often talked with me as I would come for meetings about his vision and what he saw coming down the road. And it was always bigger than life. It was always like, how are you ever going to afford that? How are you ever going to have time to do that? And he would talk about so many different types of ministries, and one of them was a college. And quite frankly, it, it didn't seem all that unusual in light of the great vision that he had. I'd like to speak to you tonight on the subject, this is the title of the tape, the tape ministry, 10 Reasons Why It Is Right to Start a Bible College. I, I, re I remember him calling me, of course at that time I was the President and General Director of Baptist International Mission. You know, we have a thousand missionaries working in a hundred different countries around the world. <laughs> it's a pretty big job, but he said, uh, he really says, God, I'd like for you to come out here and help me start this school. And I, I remember saying to him, you know, Dr. Chapel, I have another little job right now, <laughs> okay. Pastor came to us one night and said, you know, I've been praying about something for a while. I want you to pray with us for, you know, the men about it. And just pray for, we need to train the next generation of leaders. I remember Pastor uh, sharing that he felt that there was a real need to have a place where young men and women could come and be trained. I got the, the, the blessing to, to participate in the, uh, what was that, the registration? Registration. The first year. And of course, I remember we had 49 students. And just a few courses being offered, but there was an excitement in the college. These were young people that came here uh, on purpose. It's a wonderful thing to have a college you can recommend that you know will not change the beliefs you have taught to your young people. 
It's a great thing to know that they're going to come out still interested in souls, still believing in the authority of the King James Bible, still honoring their own local church, and still having a heart to please and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the, the college reflects the spirit of the church, which reflects the spirit of the pastor, who reflects the spirit of the Lord. So the college has been, to me, uh, the student body that uh, desires to do something for the Lord. Truly, they are uh, seeing themselves as laborers going into the harvest. There's just a, a sweetness about going to college and being excited about training for what God has you to do. They get good academics in a great spiritual setting. So it's been a wonderful encouragement to our church. The spirit that's in the college is first seen in the church and you see that uh, modeled in the student's life. We get a student from West Coast Baptist College into our ministry already. You don't have to, you don't have to fight them to get a soul winning. The standards are right. They have the same biblical philosophy of our ministry, and so they're ready to go when they come in. They're well trained. People around the country began to hear about West Coast and the emphasis of a local church college that was distinctive in its Baptist heritage and had a heart to do ministry in, in, in the 21st century and train some laborers for the harvest. And young people began to come from all over the world. While you're discovering and developing those gifts here in Bible college and learning the doctrines and the truths and, and developing your skill for ministry, make no mistake about the fact that before you were formed in your mother's womb that God had something more for you. And don't settle for second best if God has something more. Welcome to the groundbreaking of the new auditorium of Lancaster Baptist Church. When we started the project at the worship center, I was really quite overwhelmed by the size of it. Pastor said we need more room. Well, I could see that, and most could, but I couldn't imagine when we walked into it after it got framed and stuff, I said, wow, we'll never fill this up. Now God has allowed us to fill this building not once and not twice, but things going on all weekend long. And it's time once again for the church to say, our God is able and we will trust Him by faith. Now we were pushing toward this, this new giant building. And, and it was a project of staggering size really uh, at that time. And yet, oh, there was a very quiet but energetic confidence that this was going to happen as well. To me, it was it was truly the, the transition into what to me was really the next phase of where God wanted to take Lancaster Baptist. Welcome to Lancaster Baptist Church. In the first service in this new auditorium, we praise the Lord. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The worship center to me has always been now the central place of ministry, and it all reaches out from here. The first Sunday we got here, um, he was preaching. We were just in awe with the size of the worship center. The largest church I've ever been in, but it was extremely friendly. I mean, people were, you know, welcoming us and you know, trying to get us in our Sunday school classes. It was just the spirit, how the spirit was, and the spirit of the people. We could see that God was at work here, and he was moving in, in miraculous ways. Since we've been here, we saw the admin go up, we saw the West, we saw this building go up and almost get completely paid for. I thank God for what the Lord has done in this place. Uh, I've known Dr. Chapel since he was a young man, I've been here at the church in the early, early days, and I'm not at all surprised at what the Lord has done. And this church, and this, this pastor is making a, a real difference um, in, in this world. But the chapel has made a difference in my life. He loves people so much. And most of all, he loves the Lord. And to not only thank God for him, every time I come to this church, I'm very humbled. I have just marveled at uh, what the Lord has done in this place. And it just goes to show that when you come and you stay put and you work hard and you stay right with the Lord and you have a group of folks that follow the leadership as God has directed his man, this is what can be done. Die to sin, resist sin, stay in contact with Jesus all the time. Look for him and win everybody can to Jesus. When pastors start talking about we have to build more, you know, because we've got more people coming. 
I think that's when we all started to really, at least I think in our generation of the church, started to realize um, the real work that I think God wanted to do, not just here, but truly what he wanted to do globally. Just about everywhere I go now, uh, I, I find them using striving together materials, you know. I see them using uh, songs that somebody here has written, you know. Uh, I see them using the soul winning programs, discipleship programs. Lancaster Baptist Church is more than just a local church, it has been a resource for churches. One thing I noticed about him was that he wanted to be a genuine friend to not just me, but other preachers. I noticed that in him. So with that whole idea, the Leadership Conference, Ministry 127, striving to get the publications. Much of that started when they started having the spiritual leadership meetings. The Spiritual Leadership Conference is a conference that really uh, equips pastors. And I think there's a sincere effort being made to encourage pastors that are there and to, to really give them the vision that God can do so much more, can do great things with them. I think it's made me a better pastor. It's given me a greater heart for my our folks. It's given me a greater heart for our world and, and for this region. I, I've never invited anybody to come to a leadership meeting without getting the response after that. Hey, Brother Sis, thank you for telling me about that. I think when you come to a moment like this with the 30th anniversary and you're hearing the stories from 25 and 28 years ago and the faith and all that God did. Uh, yes, God has done some unbelievable things in the past. God is doing some great things right now. It makes you so grateful for what God has done. But in reality, some of the greatest victories have really just happened and are just on the horizon. We had a planning meeting for uh, the Easter for 2015 and pastor really kind of went out on a limb and said, you know what, guys, wh what do you guys think about us planning and working and, and really stretching ourselves to maybe reach a goal of uh, having 10,000 people on one given weekend? And on that weekend, to have well in excess of 10,000 and to see hundreds accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. I remember this past year's Easter presentation was one that uh, as a choir and orchestra we'll never forget, uh, especially at the 11 o'clock service uh, when during the invitation time so many folks were coming forward to accept Christ that choir and orchestra members were leaving the choir loft, leaving the orchestra pit to go down to counsel with folks and to lead them to Christ. I think of Love Works and equipping and mobilizing our church family to go all over the community and do all kinds of acts of service for individuals, for schools, for businesses, for our city, for our community. It was great to see how our teens responded to the Love Works program and God opened some unique doors to go into uh, the public high schools of our area and just serve them. As a result of Love Works, we saw many teens come to church for the first time and dozens of teens accept Christ as their Savior. I led my first person to the Lord through the Love Works um, outreach. The Love Works program was a big blessing too. It helped us get out in the community. Over the past couple of years, our choir and orchestra has had the opportunity twice now to go down to Christmas on the Boulevard, which is a city event. And the city's had tens of thousands of people come down for that event. And we had the opportunity to sing there and pass out gospel tracks and just to be a testimony to our city. We had a special day we wanted to have, uh, just a huge baptism service. On that day, we set up a pool outside and we saw 60 individuals come and follow the Lord and believers baptism. And of course the Walter Center is probably the big jewel in the in the last five years. And Walter Center, Walter Center yeah. um, not as being built but being paid off. Seeing the first banquet in the Walter Center was like jaw-dropping. I mean that was so cool. I think recently when he spearheaded the uh, Asian conference. You had almost 1,800 delegates that signed up. We had over 2,500 people that were able to come and listen to some sound preaching in the evening sessions. The excitement, the, the, the spirit of it was just phenomenal. We had missionaries and pastors that came from across 23 countries uh, attending that conference. Uh, we had sessions that were just what were needed uh, in terms of equipping those that are on the field. I think in the years ahead, and you know, history may record that that was one of the maybe pivotal moments for Asia. There's an excitement for what God is doing right now, but there's no mistake, the best is yet to come. But I was also very impressed with Mrs. Chapel and how wise 
and and how conversant in spiritual things that she is. And I don't I don't mean that that surprised me, but there's just great wisdom there. Everything she did, I wanted to watch very carefully. I wanted to glean and learn from her. And um, she took the time uh, and love and patience to mentor the ladies that came to the church to give us a chance to grow. Mrs. Chapel is such a blessing to me, first of all, because she taught me, she helped me learn. And uh, I'm so thankful for um, Mrs. Chapel, the godly example that she's been to me. With Mrs. Chapel, I've learned much. Um, she's been an encouragement and um, she's a godly woman and a good example for me. And I, and I can truly understand that some of Paul Chapel's blessing has come through Mrs. Chapel's ministry in his life and God blessing her. I look at the, these last 30 years, uh, they've gone by so quick. And yet, some days have been so long. Every church, every pastor is gonna have problems. I have uh, been privileged to walk with Brother Chapel through some of those. He's walked with me through some of those. I watched, of course, in our own lives, the trials that God's brought into our life. And, uh, and if it hadn't have been for the teaching of, of our pastor, uh, we wouldn't have really known how to respond. Uh, right about the time we came into this building, we had some, some people who became bitter. It is a strong belief of the deacons and the staff of this church that the Bible teaches that sharing negative views of a church after leaving with the end of making others feel negative is the equivalent of sowing discord amongst the brethren and causing division. When uh, Jessica Downey got in her car accident and a uh, pastor and a number of men in the church went over to Brother Downey's house and we just in the living room all just knelt down and just prayed. The one thing that I remember about the unity of the church with Jessica's accident is how pastor grew us up spiritually when it came to prayer. It changed us. Uh, we'd just barely been saved just a few months and uh, it changed us in the uh, just the power of prayer. From the time the church really began to blossom and become quite an impact in the world, uh, it began to draw criticism. I've seen him on a number of occasions honestly reach out to that person with a willingness to explain, with a willingness to provide information, with a sincere desire to, to win that critic over. But I think of one of the, the real times that I've, I've seen him uh, really grow spiritually was when he went through the situation with Larry's cancer. And I think as we look back on some of those challenges that pastor has faced, as the church has faced, the college, we look back and at the time we wondered, okay, God, what are you doing? But now we look back and see how it, it grew us and it grew our church and it grew the ministry in a way that maybe we didn't design, but that God was designing. And I'm thankful for a pastor that leads us to think that way. You know, he likes the picture of him standing by the stop sign in the desert. I'm thinking to myself, what are you thinking, you know? And he brought, us, brought me out here and showed me this first 20 acres. And, and I, I can still remember his excitement, wanting to show it to me and so forth. But all I could think about was, uh, uh, how in the world could he get so excited about a dust bowl with juniper trees and tumbleweed? As I stand on the land, it's just a dusty piece of ground somewhat dry and, and uh, barren this morning. But one day, Lord willing, there will be buildings raised up on this place, ball fields for our Christian school, a bus barn for our buses where we might be able to work on them, a beautiful auditorium, uh, perhaps a beautiful uh, drive entranceway onto the property. I'm hoping for a large American flag to let this community know that we love God and country. I guess I could go on all night uh, with uh, what God could do. I don't know how many churches are still going to be claiming this doctrine I pitched about tonight by the time 
Matthew's old enough to serve God. But I intend to make sure there's one around. Well, tonight we have the privilege of recognizing uh, the calling of God upon uh, our son, Brother Matt Chapel. Father in heaven, as we have our hands on Matt, Lord, we pray mostly that you would have your hand on him. I do remember a Sunday night sitting in the North Auditorium and thinking, this is now my church. And I remember looking at those faces thinking, I'm glad I'm here. Uh, this is a church where people love the Lord. This is a church that wants to do something great for God. And these people are what make this church great. And just look what God has done in this 30 years. And it's, it's not about a man, but it is about a surrendered man, and God has used him. If God could use Brother Chapel to do that in the desert, he can put a church in the Northeast, in, in suburbs, in inner cities, in mission works. For us to step back and say it can't be done is not a legitimate statement because it was accomplished there through a spirit-filled man that was willing to bear the hardship. It just shows what God can do with one man who's totally sold out and has a small group of followers that are willing to follow him. Um, and it's been just faithful men and women following the Lord and, and allowing Him to work uh, in them and through them to see what's been accomplished in 30 years. If you ever want to experience true Christianity, this is a place that you can experience it. There is absolutely no way to explain Lancaster Baptist Church except God. It's all God's doing. We can, we can only give Him credit for everything that's happened here. It's like you're part of something that really, really counts. You know, why, why did the Lord allow us to be a part of it from such an early time? The Word and the truth will be preached here, and it will change lives. Those spiritual refugees that the culture is going to begin multiplying even more, are going to be looking for answers, and they will find them here. And we wanted to see what God is going to continue to do here as He works His miracles in this place. But I don't think He's done yet. If things continue to go as they are, the impact that uh, Lancaster Baptist Church, West Coast Baptist College can have on the world, uh, I don't think there's any limit to it.